This is an examination of the hidden human condition. This is the Hidden Killers Podcast with Tony Bruschi. Nima Romani with us, president of the West Coast Trial Lawyers. Nima, I want to talk about the gag order for a moment because this keeps rearing its head in the case against Brian Koberger. Gag order's in place. It gets a little tighter. Then people try and loosen it. And then evidence gets leaked. And then people want to lift it. Specifically, Steve Gonzalez, a father of one of the victims. Uh, I cannot imagine what this man is going through with his daughter being brutally murdered, but he wants to talk. He's been very vocal from the beginning. I'm thinking it's probably somewhat cathartic for him. Uh, but is it a good idea? Is it a good idea to try and have this gag order lifted? Is this something where, yes, in the short term, may feel good, but in the long term, it could end up causing some sort of appellate issues and things of that nature if more information is uh, put out there uh, that shouldn't be, or you know, there's a lot of possibilities here. What's your thoughts on all that? Yeah, this is one of the broadest gag orders I've ever seen. Um, but these types of orders have typically been upheld. They've been litigated all the way to the Supreme Court. You know, and to the extent that, obviously, we know that gag orders of attorneys and parties, I mean, those are always ruled valid. I mean, here you're talking about a potential witness, right? Let's not forget, <laughs> it has another death penalty case there in Idaho. You know, the parents of the victims will be witnesses, if not at the you know, guilt phase, the penalty phase. So I know people are upset. Uh, frankly, I'm upset. I want more information about the case as well. Mm -hmm. But I don't think they have a strong legal footing to stand on when it comes to litigating this gag order. What would be the advantage uh, if it were to be lifted? Uh, is there any advantage other than he gets to go and, and the family and, and others uh, would be able to, to speak more freely about this? I think that is the advantage. I mean, you've lost a loved one. You've lost your child. It's probably the worst thing that any parent can experience. Now you have a court telling you you can't talk about it, at least not publicly. So um, I can imagine the frustration that the family members are going through. Uh, you know, and, and there's things that, you know, they've been upset about. For instance, the public defender's office, right, you know, mm -hmm. did represent some of the parents, not the public defender who's actually the one who's going to be handling this case. There's not a whole lot of death penalty qualified lawyers, especially in Northern Idaho. I think she might be the only one. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, the family's upset. Um, you know, there's things they want to talk about, whether it's disqualification or, you know, the, the pace um, of this case. I know they're frustrated when they want to kind of move it forward more aggressively, but I don't think they're going to um, be able to given the SCAG order. I mean, and, and given, even if they were to be able to speak, uh, it, it's, it, it's the, it's just being out in the media, being out in the public. Would that really truly affect the pace of anything uh, other than just them being able to talk more? Yeah, I don't think it's going to affect the case. I mean, you know, whenever you're dealing with a death penalty case, right, if you're the prosecution, you want to make sure, you know, all your I's are dotted, your T's are crossed. The last thing you want is case to be reversed on appeal. And we all know that when it comes to death sentences, it's far more likely that a defense attorney is going to be successful on appeal uh, mm -hmm. in a death penalty case and actually getting a jury to return a, a not guilty verdict or not return a death sentence. So the prosecution, you're, you want to keep your eye on the prize and make sure that everything you do is going to withstand scrutiny by an appellate court. So there's a much more likely chance that this could go to appeals with this being a death penalty case versus if it was not? Yeah, there's mandatory state and federal appeals whenever there's a death sentence returned. And, you know, we know that death penalty qualified jurors, jurors who are willing to follow the law and impose a death penalty are also more likely to return a guilty verdict. Now, Koberger is a unique case in that he's a pretty sophisticated fellow. Obviously, he was a PhD student in criminal justice. He's not your typical murderer or alleged murderer. Mm -hmm. um, here's someone who was very careful um, you know, you allegedly left just a single source of DNA at the crime scene. You would expect a lot more in a gruesome quadruple murder. So, you know, it's not the type of slam dunk case that, you know, Chad Dable and Lori Vallow is, in my opinion. I still think it'll end up in a guilty verdict. But between the gag order and a, a lot of out of evidence coming out and, you know, this particular defendant, um, it's it's more of a unique case and certainly not a sure thing for the prosecution. We continue to see more and more documents uh, being dropped just last night. A, a whole slew of them uh, came out. I have not had a chance to go through many of them 
uh, in in great detail. But I do know that uh, just from some of the headlines that I've seen, uh, some of uh, there has there was blood found on several items in uh, Koberger's possession. Now, as far as whose blood that is, that has not yet been revealed. Do you think there's a treasure trove of evidence here that we're not seeing, we're not hearing about yet? That is is going to be far more uh, impactful against Koberger once this thing gets to trial. That it's just being held close to the vest at this moment in time. I think so, Tony. I think you know between the gag order, between the fact that search warrants were executed in three separate states, right? Obviously, the murders happened. Uh, in Idaho, but Koberger lived in Washington State. Obviously, he was traveling to Pennsylvania to his parents' house when he was arrested. You know, I think that white Hyundai Elantra, that vehicle, I mean, that would be the treasure trove, in my opinion. You know, we, we are starting to see trickles of evidence when these search warrants are returned, executed, and the returns are filed with the court. But I think it's the preliminary hearing where this is all going to come out, right? I mean, then the state's going to have to present its evidence. Obviously, the defense isn't going to waive prelim in a case like this. So that's when I fully expect to see all the forensics come out. And we still don't know what he's going to plead as he has not uh, made a, a plea as of yet with what we know thus far. What is your assumption here? Is he going to plead not guilty or when all of this comes out in the preliminary hearing is it going to be so overwhelming that maybe it will be some sort of uh, a, a deal made to, to avoid the death penalty or something of a lesser sentence? You know, Idaho is unique, like you mentioned, in that defendants don't have to plead until after the prelim, right? Mm -hmm. Most states like California, where I am, I mean, you plead and then, you know, it's set for a prelim uh, unless there's a grand jury indictment. So you're right. There's been no plea entered yet. I think if you're the prosecution in the state, you can't offer um, a lifetime deal. I mean, it's such a gruesome murder for college kids. Uh, we don't have a clear motive, might have been stalking, but I mean, this is the type of case, if you believe in the death penalty, Tony, it's a death penalty case. So it's going to go. And, and like I said, uh, Koberger, he's a careful fellow. He and reportedly wears gloves at the grocery store, right? Puts his, uh, takes trash and puts them in baggies. So, you know, there's no DNA. So I think given the type of defendant that we have in this particular case, I can't see any type of uh, pretrial resolution. I think we're going to go to trial. This is an examination of the hidden human condition. This is the Hidden Killers Podcast with Tony Bruschi. Nima Romani, thank you so much for your insight. President of the West Coast Trial Lawyers, always appreciate your insight on this program. If you want to weigh in on anything we're talking about, we got a phone number for it. It's 888 888- Five killer 888-554-5537 to weigh in on anything we're talking about we'd love to hear your voice my name is tony bruski you can follow me on twitter at tony b pod stay with us